Dragon's Dogma is one of my all-time favorite games. As of me writing the script, it's less than a week until the sequel comes out. And there's one video I've always wanted to make about the original, but never bothered to invest the time. The most slept-on feature of the first game. And that, of course, is speedrun mode. In this video, I'm going to walk you through my experience with speedrun mode from start to finish. And fair warning, this video will naturally contain spoilers about late-game events. I must admit I paid no attention to this feature for my first couple playthroughs of the game. To be frank, the game is single-player, and for most people, including myself, it seems like there'd be no real appeal to trying to get a fast time, since I would surely be a lot slower than any dedicated speedrunner with significant time investment. I also didn't really understand how it could be interesting. I figured it would just be the base game, but add a timer on the top right corner of the screen, which is ironically fairly accurate. But I did eventually do it, simply because I loved the game so much I wanted to fully experience it, not to mention I was going for all achievements. Note that completing the speedrun mode is the rarest achievement, with only 1.2% of the Steam players unlocking it. Well, speedrun mode was the dark horse that ended up being my all-time favorite playthrough of the game, and it's not so much because of the practice and execution that goes into having extremely competitive times, but rather the insanely interesting routing that the game allows. The rules of speedrun mode are pretty simple, and the game will explain it to you if you ever open it. It puts you right at the start of the game in exactly the same manner as a New Game Plus, and you have to play until you defeat the last boss and the game ends. You cannot save, and if you die at any point, which is notably quite easy in Dragon's Dogma, the playthrough also ends, unless of course you have a wakestone to revive yourself. This means you must do the entire playthrough in one sitting, which sounds very intimidating on the surface. Like New Game Plus, you start the playthrough at your current level and with all of your existing fast travel points set. But unlike New Game Plus, nothing you do carries over to your main file. Any items you find are not saved, but more importantly, any resources you expend are not lost, which means you can be very reckless with your consumables. There are no time thresholds to meet, the only reward for speedrun mode only hinges on you completing it at all, so really, it's spiritually more like a one coin clear than a speedrun. Especially because the timer doesn't tick down in menus like it would with RTA timing. Before I ever attempted speedrun mode, I naturally did a normal playthrough where I started thinking about cutting out the fluff, doing only the absolutely required actions to beat the game. Dragon's Dogma allows the player to place their own fast travel points, so I spent a little while figuring out the most optimal places to put them that I could instantly go wherever I needed to. This is one of the main reasons that speedrun mode is even possible. The game is dramatically quicker when you can just fast travel to each new point of progression. And I started trying to figure out which quests I can do faster, or which components of quests I could skip. And it's here where I started to realize something as I routed. Almost every single required quest of the playthrough has some significant bypass tied to it if the player is creative. And to me at least, the dramatically different strategy you used to beat the game on speedrun mode was very interesting. Considering so few people have attempted the run, I think most people have no exposure to the speedrun routes available to the player. So that's going to be the subject of this video. I'm going to briefly walk you through everything the game expects you to do to beat it, in order, then I'll show off the speedrun strategy for each one. Our very first task is to fight the dragon as it attacks Casardus. Now you can't actually kill or even harm the dragon here, but most players would typically fight it until they get enough hits, die, or take long enough that the fight automatically ends. This doesn't take very long, but speedrun mode has an amusing strategy. Leaving the battlefield will instantly cause the player to lose, reducing the fight to mere seconds. Our next required quest is probably the single fastest quest in the game, and really takes the same amount of time on a normal playthrough as speedrun mode. We have to choose our starting job. Only the three basic vocations are available, but Strider is a strong candidate for the vocation we pick even if we had access to all nine. This gives us both daggers and a short bow, which also gives us access to whatever skills we'd had equipped. In the interest of going fast, the best two skills I can see are Mad Run and Instant Reset. Mad Run is a command dash which seems to move the fastest of any action in the game, but it has a bit of recovery when you stop. Instant Reset, meanwhile, can be used during any skill and will immediately put you back to your neutral state, which allows you to use Mad Dash again. This loop is slightly faster than running, but consumes a lot of stamina, which brings me to our next stop, going to our storage and withdrawing items we'll be using throughout the run. Obviously we'll grab a much better bow and daggers, but also our speedy consumables. The star player here is an item called Liquid Vim, which gives the player infinite stamina for 45 seconds. We have to make for the encampment now, which due to us not having fast travel yet, is as simple as running directly there. On the way, we pass Raynard, who's being attacked by goblins. Most NPCs, upon being killed, will respawn in 7 in-game days, but Raynard is actually permanently dead if he's not rescued during this sequence, so goodbye Raynard. Once we're at the encampment, we talk to a Riftstone, then we kill a Cyclops outside, and here's our first look at how combat will work for speedrun mode. Enemies are the same difficulty as they are in normal mode, and you might have noticed I'm ridiculously overleveled and geared out, but even if you're not, the strategy is the same. Prior to starting speedrun mode, we buy a bunch of blast arrows which do dramatically more damage than regular arrows. Additionally, we load up on an item called Conqueror's Periapt, which raises strength and can be stacked four times. Both of these, combined with the shortbow skill Fivefold Flurry, which shoots five arrows at once, will make short work of any foe. There are surprisingly few mandatory enemies in Dragon's Dogma, and almost all of them will be killed this way. Now we make our way back to the Riftstone and create our main pawn. Sincerely, I didn't know what to make for speedrun mode, and I still don't. The run basically wouldn't change if your pawn didn't exist, since it's 99% player actions. I guess technically a bigger pawn has a greater carrying capacity if I'm going to have a pack mule, but it doesn't matter much. Now we talk to Mercedes and sleep to initiate a Hydra fight. 
Again, the speedrun strat is simply to kill it as fast as possible, so we do. We don't actually have access to fast travel yet, and our next task is to escort the Hydra Head to Grinsorin. On the way, we're stopped by an NPC who tells us our childhood friend has disappeared into a highly dangerous area looking for a cure for our curse, but I'm sure she'll be fine. Instead, we make our way to the Way Castle where the Hydra Head is stationed, chugging Liquid Bim as we go. We arrive at probably the most maligned quest in the game, and actually this is the only quest where there's no significant bypass. We have to escort the Oxen Cart all the way to Grand Soren, and we're limited by the speed of the cart, which we can't actually change much. The main speed strat here is to simply kick the Ox, which causes it to move quickly for a short period, but it takes some damage. And if its health ever runs out, it stops for a short time. It's actually possible to heal the Ox by using group heal items like Spring Water or Balmy Perfume, and if I deliberately allow myself to get run over by the Ox, I can bait a mage to heal me, and the Endodyne will heal the Ox too. A surprisingly big chunk of speedrun mode is simply this quest, but I'll spare you guys. Once we hit Grand Sorum, we have to do the quest in the Everfall, and this is probably the most amusing skip in the game. Normally, you have to go down a massive spiral staircase with a few diversions into catacombs filled with undead and skeletons, and when you hit the bottom, tentacles from an evil eye start spawning and chase you back out in an exciting escape sequence. Honestly, it's quite a fun and engaging quest, but of course, the fastest way to the bottom is actually straight down. When you die from fall damage and resurrect using a wake stone, you actually respawn where you died, which means we can get to the bottom of the Everfall in seconds rather than half an hour. And then once we're at the bottom and survey it, we can simply fairy stone out, skipping the climb. We don't even have to talk to Barnaby to complete the quest. This is probably the most interesting part of the speedrun tactically. You're given a choice of four quests, and you have to complete any two to proceed, though you can choose to do all four if you like. Naturally, this means I had to do all four quests to figure out which ones could be completed the fastest. One of them is very straightforward, we simply have to talk to the Dragonforged, and we can fast travel directly to him. However, the other three, when done normally, are all theoretically quite similar in length. We can either explore a catacomb, break a siege at the Shadow Fort, or search for a missing survey party at the Water God's Altar. It seems there's some discussion on which method is actually the fastest, but the Water God's Altar has the most significant and interesting skip, so it's the one I chose. First we talk to the Head Priest, then we warp to the Way Castle, and glitch or fall damage our way down to the Altar. We talk to the NPC outside, then enter, ignore all the enemies, do a sprinting double jump to bypass lowering the bridge, and find the Surveyor's corpse. Then we run back out to the NPC outside, who kindly asks us to continue his mission and gather five Altar Slates from the dungeon. However, by gathering the Altar Slates in a previous playthrough without giving them to him to finish the quest, we can simply hand them in now and skip having to collect them during the speedrun. For the record, a quest I didn't do has a skip which I didn't find, which is faster and also very hilarious. You warp to the Shadow Fort that's besieged by goblins, and you friendly fire the leader of the soldiers trying to reclaim the fort. Then you warp back to Maximilian to tell him the soldiers were killed. This is one of very few quests in the game you can actually fail, and failing it still resolves it and allows you to progress. Anyway, with both our quests done, we gain access to the manor where we'll be taking quests from here on out. I didn't figure this out during my routing, but from here on out, the fastest way to the manor is actually to attack an NPC and get arrested, then break out of jail using a skeleton key, whereupon every NPC mysteriously forgets you committed a crime. So we meet with the duke for a few seconds, then turn tail to run back into the courtyard, where we see his child bride Eleanor tending to the flowers. It seems that the duke is physically abusing her, and she desperately needs someone to deliver her from his clutches. So naturally, we simply ignore her and try and leave the manor, which permanently locks us out of her questline but allows us to accept Aldous' progression quests. His first two are fairly straightforward. First, there's been a griffin plaguing the area. Second, the resident plutocrat and known romancer of Arisen, Fornival, is on trial for fraud. We are tasked with finding evidence either incriminating or exonerating him, as well as gathering character witnesses that can describe the manner of his dealings. For the Griffin quest, you normally follow a team south for a brief encounter with it in the mountains. Then you watch it fly away to the distant Blue Moon Tower to roost. This is one of the longest quests in the game, where you spend hours making your way north along the knoll, through the forest, across the mountains and crags, to the distant tower, then scale the tower for an epic battle with the Griffin at the top. However, because we're overleveled, juicing on Conqueror's Periaps, and firing blast arrows in fives from a Gold Dragonforge Darkening Storm, we can easily kill the griffin on our first encounter. Killing the griffin here skips the entire quest. As for Fornival's trial, finding a skip is pretty easy. We simply sleep at the inn repeatedly until the trial date without turning in a single piece of evidence or bringing forth a single witness. Amusingly, Aldous does have some choice words for you if you resolve the quest this way. Aldous now has two new quests. We have to suppress a rebellion at Wimbluff Tower, and we have to recover the Duke's ring, which has been stolen from the manor. The theft was committed by Salamet, and normally the player has to talk to NPCs in the manor to find out it was him, talk to NPCs in town to figure out where he's hiding, fight him there, go back to town to find out where he might retreat to, 
and fight him there too. However, if the player already has the Worm King's Ring from a previous playthrough, they can forge a replica at the Black Cat. It's funny to think that Aldus asks the Arisen to recover a stolen ring, which you can then immediately pull out of your pocket and hand to him, yet this apparently presents no red flags. I'm suddenly not surprised the ring got stolen in the first place. As for suppressing the rebellion, we can fast travel right to the tower and scale it to see the traitor Sir Julian challenging Mercedes to a one-on-one -on -one duel after a vicious verbal beatdown. Mercedes insists we don't interfere, but that's slow, so instead we immediately kill Julian and then fast travel back to the manor. Aldous then tells us to return to the southern way castle. We warp there, where a guard tells us it was a bait to take us away while a monster is loosed on Grand Sorin. We fast travel back, and despite being god for ostensibly seconds, it's enough time for our cockatrice to attack the craftsman's quarter. We nuke it with blast arrows to the throat, then rush to the duke, who tells us to meet him in his treasury. Amusingly, it's actually faster to grab the duke and throw him off the second story balcony, then sprint into the treasury before you can get arrested, than it is to simply follow him down the stairs with his extremely slow walk. We're given a quest to route the last of the murderous cult known as Salvation at the Great Wall, so naturally we fast travel there and skip the 30 minute run. There's no real speed strat here other than skipping all the enemies, but this quest does have three required foes in a chimera and two whites, which we'll cook with our flying grenades. Something happens during a cutscene I skip, and suddenly we're at the bottom of a ruined fort with a new quest encouraging us to go meet with the Dragonforged. But instead we're sprinting directly to the dragon. We can ignore all the enemies on our way over, but there is one interesting thing near the end. There's a room with a gore chimera where you have to kill it then take turns standing on four pressure plates to open the door. The switches depress faster with more pawns standing on them, but even with a full party it takes several minutes to depress all four switches. But amusingly the gore chimera is very heavy and can depress a switch instantly. So rather than killing it, you can simply lead it around the room and have it open the door for you. This part was very slow for me because my palm was alive. I definitely should have killed him off at some point during the run. As a reward for the Chimera's help, we leave it alive and sprint to the next room where we meet the dragon face to face. Normally, Grigori reveals he's kidnapped our beloved, who in this case seems to be the lovely Mercedes, and that he's willing to deal with me that if I let him kill her, he'll leave the land and allow others to think he was slain by my hand. Turning him down starts a long and epic boss battle where we fight him off in the ruins of an ancient castle, sprint from tower to tower to reach Ballista to shoot him out of the sky, cling to his back across a huge flying segment, then face him head-on in a massive arena in what's probably the best boss battle in video games since Xemnas and Kingdom Hearts 2. But all of that is very slow. There exists an extremely expensive arrow called the Maker's Finger, which instantly kills almost any target in the game. As Grigori makes us his offer, he's a sitting duck for the arrow, and our shot kills him instantly and bypasses the entire fight. It's possible to use the Maker's Finger on other required fights too, but you can only hold one at a time, and it's only sold by Fornival, who's actually rotting in a cell somewhere right now. The credits are all here, but speedrun mode isn't done. We go to Grand Sorn and ignore the Duke's summon, instead grabbing 20 wake stones from a previous playthrough, and using them to instantly open the bottomless pit into a portal to God's Realm or something, I don't actually remember. Once we're in there, it's just a matter of running directly to God and then killing him, which takes far longer than you'd think, since for a good minute, all you can do is reduce him to 1 HP and wait for him to finish his God monologue, which is refreshingly not villainous. When you finally win, he reveals everything, the dragon, the heart theft, the meeting with you, is all part of a massive test to reveal whether you have it in you to act as a God in his stead, and grant him relief from the role. We tell him we have no questions about the nature of the universe because we're in a hurry, and he asks us to stab him with the God's Bane, a magical dagger capable of killing otherwise immortal beings. We do, but after mere seconds of ascending to godhood, we decide we've had enough and stab ourselves with the dagger too. Some other stuff happens too, I think, but as far as the game is concerned, we're finished with the speedrun. So while my first playthrough probably took weeks, I've managed to finish this run in just over 30 minutes, which for what it's worth is over twice as long as the current world record. A reward is two sets of clothing, a male-only set based on Barnaby and a female-only set based on Celine. In a way, I can understand why so few people have completed speedrun mode. First of all, it's fundamentally something you can't really do on your first playthrough, and as you can see from the achievements, most people haven't gotten the achievement for beating the game more than once. It's difficult, since you have to beat the game in one sitting, and without dying, and I'm sure a lot of people see it and think it's just an arbitrary challenge with a high score that will be fundamentally meaningless. Especially since your result isn't even put in any kind of leaderboard. But I think it's fascinating how much the game changes from a more traditional playthrough, and it really shows off the creativity both by the developers and the player and what kinds of skips are possible. I found it to be intensely satisfying trying to figure out what I could do to go faster, and realizing just how much of this massive game is surprisingly optional. I'm really eager to see if they try something like this for Dragon's Dogma 2, though to my knowledge they haven't even indicated the presence of a New Game Plus mechanic yet. All the same, I'm beyond excited for it and hope it'll bring me as many years of joy as the original did. Thanks for watching.